Story 1. I've shared before about the good grocery store where I worked in high school. We had a few troublesome customers and many senior citizens who needed extra help. But overall, it was well run with a great manager. The grocery store I worked at for one summer during college, however, was a completely different story. It was the bad place. It was 1994, and I worked in a chain grocery store with a terrible manager, who I'll call Awful. He was fresh out of business school and just happened to be the regional director's son, which meant nothing ever stuck to him. If anything went wrong, he'd pin the blame on an assistant manager or hush it up with help from the regional office. Awful had even managed to get his mistress hired as one of the assistant managers. I only saw her in the store twice, and both times she was shopping. Once, she didn't even pay. Awful paid no attention to his employees' schedules or personal commitments. There were a lot of teenagers working there who were attending summer school, and he didn't care. He scheduled shifts however he wanted and left us to swap shifts with each other. I remember one girl being told she had to miss school because she couldn't find someone to cover for her shift. Completely illegal. He also didn't care about labor laws. His philosophy was, if the computer accepts it, it's fine. Back then, payroll systems were new, and they'd accept anything you input. He had the teenagers working hours they legally weren't allowed to too late at night, too early in the morning, and lots of overtime. If anyone complained, he'd threaten to fire them. That was his response to everything. In a place where jobs were hard to come by, the threat of being fired was enough to keep people in line. There were kids crying because he wouldn't let them take family vacations or because they had to miss school tests. One guy was even fired for attending his sister's wedding after warning Awful about it months in advance. It was a holiday weekend, so no one could swap shifts with him. Awful was rarely in the store for his full shift. He'd clock in, do a few key tasks, and then leave. He'd come back for the bank deposits mid-shift and then disappear again until it was time to clock out. He left all the work to the assistant managers or other random employees. If he was the only manager on duty, he'd leave his override badge on the office desk so we could grab it whenever we needed to override register errors another violation of company policy. I should also mention that the national office was obsessed with mystery shopper reports, which came directly from third-party companies. We would often get conflicting instructions because national directives based on those reports didn't always match up with our regional policies. It was a mess. Mystery shoppers, though, were easy to spot. They would go straight to the bakery, ask for a price on a special order cake without buying it, visit the bathroom, stop by the fish counter, ask for a price check, and make us unring something during checkout. It became pretty obvious who they were. During my last week at this disaster of a job, before I returned to college, I spotted an obvious mystery shopper. She had a notepad and was going through all the standard steps. Awful had already left the store shortly after opening, the assistant manager had been fired, and the only other cashier was on lunch. It was late morning and relatively quiet. I figured it was time for this place to face some consequences. When the mystery shopper came up with her price check, I forgot to hit the price check button and rang it up for real. Whoops. Time to get the manager's override badge. I grabbed it, did the override, and then accidentally tossed the badge so hard it flew across the desk and fell behind a mess of cables. Whoops again. If you watch the security tapes, it probably looked very intentional, but it was my last week and I didn't care anymore. About this time, the other cashier, Jenny, returned from lunch. I told her that things were about to get chaotic and suggested she go home sick if she wanted to avoid it. Jenny, however, laughed and said she wanted to stick around for the show. Besides, we had a lunch rush coming soon from the nearby construction site. When the lunch rush hit, the store got busier and mystery shopper returned to my register, needing me to unring something. I flipped on the help needed light. Nothing happened. I called for Awful over the intercom, using his full name. Jenny, catching on, told me to just go grab the override badge from the office. But I pointed out that doing so was against company policy, even though we all knew Awful had told us to do it. 
I went to the office and pretended to search for the badge. I even called down to Jenny to ask if she had it. Jenny eventually came up to help, but by then, I had already set things in motion. What I hadn't anticipated was Jenny going nuclear. While I was planning to just give the mystery shopper a bad visit full of violations, Jenny took it further. She apologized to the mystery shopper and told her she'd have to switch to Jenny's line because I couldn't void the transaction without the override badge. She couldn't log into two registers at once either, so I had to help pack up the mystery shopper's cart. Jenny then, accidentally, rang up a gallon of milk six times. Whoops. Still no override card. We apologized profusely to customers, explaining that we had no idea where Awful was and that we weren't allowed to call the regional office per his strict but illegal orders. Many customers took down the regional office's number and called themselves. It was chaotic, but we were secretly enjoying every second. It took the regional office two hours to send someone who could clear the registers. By then, we had missed the entire lunch rush and our store's performance metrics for the day were going to be terrible. The regional guy tried to cover for Awful by blaming a computer outage and possibly even sabotaging some equipment to sell that story. Awful finally returned after I had clocked out, but I heard the regional guy was still there doing his job. Awful was unbearable for the next few days, but I was already halfway out the door. Jenny didn't care either since she had been doing the work of a head cashier without the pay. A few weeks later, I heard from Jenny that a national audit team had come down to investigate. The mystery shopper's report didn't align with the computer outage excuse, and they started digging into the store's records. They found multiple labor violations for teenagers working overtime and outside of legal hours, scheduling issues during school time, manager absenteeism, and no vacation time allowed. They also discovered that the assistant manager Awful's mistress had been on the payroll full-time, but was never actually working. Her clock ins and outs were suspiciously aligned with Awful's shifts, even though she was never physically in the store. I don't know if the labor violations were covered up, but Awful, his father, and his mistress were all fired or quietly resigned. The store reportedly went back to being functional, and Jenny found a better job soon after. As for me, I never worked in retail again. Story 2 This story takes place in the late 90s, around 1998 to 1999. At the time, I had been training in martial arts since 1994. My main discipline was Hapkido, but over time, my class had transitioned into a more mixed martial arts MMA style, largely because my father, who was an assistant instructor, had trained in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu along with other martial arts. He was always eager to help my friends grow as martial artists and as individuals. I had been a part of this class since 1996, with my dad pre-training me two years before that. By 1998, a new student, who I'll refer to as Entitled Kid, joined the class, enrolled by his mother, Entitled Mother. Entitled Kid was the tallest student in the class tall and lanky with very little muscle compared to his height, much like Snoop Dogg. Within a week, Entitled Kid started showing his true colors. He began trash-talking other students, skipping exercises during warm-ups, and picking on the smaller students, myself included. Slowly, Entitled Kid became one of the most disliked students in the entire class. The instructors started noticing his behavior and punished him with extra exercises, but this only highlighted his laziness and lack of respect for others. Eventually, Entitled Kid became the class troublemaker, and even the instructors didn't like him. The Day of Reckoning On one particular day, our instructor rented out a community hall for class. He wanted to teach us how to do judo rolls properly, using the hall's elevated stage, which had a set of five stairs, we were instructed to perform a front flip down the stairs and land into a judo roll on someone inch thick mats. After class, Entitled Kid decided to run around with his training gloves on, punching anyone he wanted as hard as he could for his own amusement. Not wanting to get into trouble or a fight since my dad disciplined me strictly, I tried to keep my distance until it was time to go home. I stepped outside the hall to avoid the chaos. 
apparently, entitled kid saw me slip out and decided to chase me, likely intending to make me his next target. I ran around tables and corners, but I realized I wouldn't be able to outrun him, and he wasn't going to stop. As he closed the gap between us, I turned around without gloves on and threw a wild punch at his face. By sheer luck, my punch landed square on his nose. An entitled kid immediately dropped to the ground, bleeding profusely. Overwhelmed with emotion, I started yelling, possibly crying, and shouted something along the lines of, I'm tired of being picked on, you always get away with it, and I'm sick of you bullying me and my friends. One of the instructors heard the commotion and came to check on us. He saw me standing there with clenched fists, ready to defend myself, while entitled kid was on the ground holding his bleeding nose. The instructor quickly escorted both of us back into the hall, where my dad and entitled mother were waiting. Entitled mother screamed when she saw entitled kid's bloody face, immediately threatening to sue whoever hurt her baby. The instructors tended to entitled kid while my dad pulled me aside to hear my side of the story. I explained that entitled kid had been going around punching people, and I tried to avoid him, but he chased me. I didn't want to get hurt, so I punched him first. My dad had always taught me that I was nobody's punching bag, and if I ever fought for the wrong reasons, we'd spar, which terrified me. He stared at me for a few seconds, likely trying to see if I was lying. After hearing my story, he told me to sit down on a chair by the wall. By this time, entitled kid's face was mostly cleaned up, an entitled mother was holding a paper towel over his nose, trying to stop the bleeding. She asked him what had happened, an entitled kid told her, I was just playing tag with everyone, and my name punched me in the face because he doesn't like me. I remember the next part vividly because it became a legendary moment in the class. My dad, who had just walked about eight, ten feet away, turned and said, Wait, did you say my name punched you because he doesn't like you? Entitled kid hesitated. Ooh, yeah. Entitled mother jumped in, who are you exactly? My dad responded, I'm my name's father. I wish we could have met under better circumstances. Entitled kid, why is your story so different from my name's? Entitled mother retorted, Oh really? What did he say happened? My dad calmly replied, He told me that your son has been bullying him and that today he finally reached his breaking point. Entitled mother wasn't convinced. Oh, I highly doubt that. My dad turned to the class and asked, Everyone, how many of you were punched by entitled kid today outside of practice? Five students raised their hands. How many of you have seen entitled kid bully my name or anyone else? Nine students raised their hands. How many of you were playing tag with entitled kid today? No hands went up. At this point, entitled mother, still in denial, exclaimed, they're all lying. My dad replied, I wonder what a judge would think of such a conspiracy. Look, your son isn't the angel you think he is. The reason you don't know is that you never stay to watch him in class. You can ask any of the instructors about his behavior. Entitled mother didn't seem interested in hearing from the instructors. Why would I ask people who are obviously on your side? I'd rather talk to one of these other parents. My dad gestured to the parents present. Take your pick, there are four parents here right now. Entitled mother fell silent. Then, my dad called me over. If entitled kid bullies you again, you have my permission to defend yourself, and if you see him bullying anyone else, I expect you to speak up. Doing nothing when someone is being bullied is the same as condoning it. Do you understand? I nodded. Yes, sir. My dad then turned to Entitled Mother. If your son continues to bully our students or my son, you will hear about it. Any questions or comments? Entitled Mother, flustered, told Entitled Kid to keep pressure on his nose and that they would deal with it when they got home. They left shortly after. Entitled Kid attended only two more classes after that one of which his mother stayed for before quitting. He lived nearby, so my friends and I saw him occasionally, but he always avoided us. Hope you enjoyed the story. Story 3 I'm a 35-year-old from the UK, 
and this story takes place during my first summer between finishing high school and starting college sixth form when I was 16. I got my first job working weekends at a local convenience store chain. It was only a minute's walk from home, and I worked easy evening shifts on Saturdays and Sundays. I would also pick up extra shifts from other staff when they needed time off due to holidays or sickness for a little extra cash. Apart from my job interview, I hardly ever saw the manager let's call her Felicity, except when she came in as a customer. That didn't bother me much since Felicity always made sure my wages were paid on time and accurately, and any changes in shifts were handled by the assistant manager, who I got along with very well. I'm not a confrontational person by nature, and back then, I avoided conflict even more. But, as you'll see, my patience with Felicity wore thin. Six months into the job, the assistant manager left to run a new store, and a new assistant manager was hired right away. Let's call him Gary. Spoiler alert, Gary was a nightmare. My first weekend working with Gary went smoothly, and I showed him the basic tasks I typically handled, such as restocking and managing customers. At the end of that weekend shift, I sat down with Gary in the office to explain how shift changes had been handled by the previous assistant manager. Immediately, this became an issue for Gary. He insisted that all shift changes had to be approved by him or Felicity in advance. I said that was fine, but asked what to do when I got a last-minute call late at night or early in the morning to cover for someone who was sick for the opening shift at 5 a.m. His response? That's their problem. They shouldn't be sick. Not exactly the most empathetic attitude, but that wasn't even the worst part. The real problem would come later. Now, a side note, I'm a golfer, and back then, I was fairly good for my age. I had qualified through local and regional competitions for the final of an amateur tournament to be held at St. Andrews on a Saturday and Sunday. This was the biggest competition of my golfing career, and I had booked the time off well in advance, with approval. The next Saturday, I showed up for my usual shift. Gary was there, but he didn't even greet me and barely spoke to me all shift. No big deal I already knew he was a toxic person, so I kept my head down and did my job. After we closed the store, Gary locked up but stayed on the premises, which was unusual. I didn't think much of it and went home. The same thing happened on Sunday. He stayed behind after locking up without saying much. Then, on Monday morning, everything escalated. As I was getting ready for college, there was a knock on the door. To my shock, it was four police officers. After confirming my identity, they placed me in handcuffs and arrested me for theft. Off to the police station I went. After being booked, searched, and left in a cell for hours without any answers, I was finally questioned. They asked if I knew where Gary was. I explained that I had last seen him the night before when we closed the store and that he had stayed behind. They informed me that I had been seen on CCTV footage, along with Gary, taking the entire week's cash takings from the office safe. I denied everything, stating that I hadn't been in the office at all that night, as I had no reason to go in with Gary on shift. I also explained that while I had access to the office via a keypad, I didn't have a key to the safe only Gary and Felicity had those. After more questioning, I was sent back to my cell. Later in the afternoon, I was released when they realized I had been mistakenly identified. The CCTV footage only showed one person, and it clearly wasn't me. They apologized, explaining that they had acted on information provided by Felicity before obtaining the footage themselves. At least they gave me a ride home. By this point, my mom had been informed of what happened and had left work to come home. She was fuming. After a polite sit-down with the officers over tea, where my five two-inches mom looked ready to tear them apart, we were left in disbelief at the whole situation. More than anything, I felt relieved. Once the officers left, we headed to the shop since Felicity was there with another officer reviewing the CCTV footage of Gary. When we arrived, Felicity immediately apologized, although it felt forced, likely due to the presence of the officer and my visibly angry mum. She claimed the mix-up was due to her pulling the wrong CCTV file. Then, things took a turn. 
Felicity had the audacity to tell me that because they were short on staff for the weekend, my holiday would be cancelled. Both my mom and I burst out laughing, thinking it was a joke. It wasn't. Felicity sternly told me, you can work or look for another job. I just smiled, thanked her for the opportunity, and told her to get lost. As I turned to leave, I had to gently guide my furious mother outside before she said something we'd both regret. As for the revenge, it came later. At my mum's insistence, I contacted the area manager. They had heard about the incident, but weren't informed of my wrongful arrest, or the real reason I quit. The area manager took the time to meet me in person at a coffee shop to discuss the situation. After hearing my story, they asked if I wanted to take my case to a tribunal for constructive dismissal. I declined, as I had already found a new job, and my main concern at the time was getting my hands on the latest video game that had just been released. The area manager informed me that after a brief investigation, they discovered Felicity had been falsifying her hours, marking herself as being on shift every weekend with me to make up her hours. She was fired immediately and the company opened an investigation into her misconduct. I provided a statement outlining everything that had happened. As a gesture of goodwill, the area manager even surprised me with a box containing the game I had been after, complete with a limited edition controller. I still think that was a fair exchange for everything I went through. A couple of months later, the police updated me that Gary had been caught 200 miles away trying to buy illegal substances from an undercover agent. Only a small portion of the stolen money was recovered, and it turned out Gary had been in and out of prison before starting the job. The company took Felicity to court for negligence, and she was ordered to repay the missing amount, which amounted to several thousand pounds. Story 4 this happened a while ago when I was around 13 or 14 years old. My family and I were on a vacation with my best friend. The plan was to stay at the lake for five days and then head back home. Now, my mom can be difficult at times, so I wasn't surprised when she started having a bad attitude toward me. After three days of being at the lake, I was completely exhausted. I had spent the whole day out on the water, and all I wanted to do was relax in the camping tent and sleep. However, my mom decided it was the perfect time to ask for my help. She wanted me to carry my baby brother, who was about a year old, down to the lake, bathe him, and bring him back. The lake was about a ten-minute walk away, and I was so worn out that I told her, No, you can do it yourself. I guess that wasn't the answer she was hoping for because she immediately started yelling at me about how I was a terrible sister and child who never helped her and kept ranting on. After about half an hour of her yelling, she asked if I was ready to help her yet. I said no again and pointed out that she hadn't even left the van all day, so she should have plenty of energy to do it herself. That was the last straw for her. She screamed at my dad to pack everything up, took away my phone, and grounded me until further notice. On the car ride home, I had to ride with her alone we had taken two cars because we didn't all fit in one and she lectured me the entire two-hour drive. She talked about respect, how I should behave, how I needed to help out more around the house, and how I should spend more time with the family. She also said I should get a new hobby because, in her opinion, I was on my phone all the time. Cue the malicious compliance. I decided that if my mom wanted me to follow her advice, I would just not in the way she expected. We arrived home around 11 p.m., and for some reason, she stayed up until 3 and the next morning, I was up at 9 am, and I decided that my new hobby was playing the flute very loudly. I went into the yard and played the flute so poorly and so loudly that it made my brother cry, even though my parents were all the way on the other side of the house with the windows closed. When my mom came out to tell me to stop, I politely reminded her that I was just following her advice by picking up a new hobby. She couldn't say anything because I was being perfectly respectful. For the next two weeks, I kept the house spotless, but I also made sure to go to bed earlier than everyone else, so I could wake up a little bit earlier each day. Every morning, I would play the flute for about an hour. I think I eventually got to the point where I was playing the flute at five and my mom was slowly losing her mind, and I knew it. 
I also started lecturing my parents about their manners, and since I was technically right, they couldn't argue with me. I stuck to my mom and dad like glue, talking their ears off all day long. I made everyone watch those boring educational films that no one enjoys, forced them into family bonding activities like baking cookies, and left messes on purpose. When they asked me to clean up, I'd say, Sorry, I already cleaned the house today. Can you do it? I also quietly woke my brother up from his naps, making sure my parents didn't notice so they would have to deal with him all day. After about two and a half weeks of this, my mom was so fed up that she finally gave me my phone back. It's been two or three years since this incident, and I haven't been grounded since. Story 5 I'm a 24-year-old woman living on my own, apart from my parents. I'm currently in a bit of a complicated situation with my friend, whom I'll call David. We had a brief relationship a few months ago, and now things have slowly started happening again between us. Initially, we were just hanging out, enjoying each other's company, but it gradually turned into more. The issue is that my parents knew about our first relationship. David used to be really close to my dad, they were almost like father and son, but after David and I got involved, my dad became controlling. He told David he couldn't have any contact with me outside of a group chat that we're all in. We both think this is ridiculous. A few weeks ago, David and I were hanging out, and we went to a store to get some snacks. While we were there, my parents showed up. They don't live in the same city as me, I live about 20 minutes away, so it was strange for them to randomly appear at a store near my house. They claimed they were there to find batteries. My dad confronted David, saying he told him not to be around me. Then he told me not to come crying to him when I get heartbroken. Later, my mom texted me, saying it was the Holy Spirit that led them there to intervene. Oddly enough, this encounter led David and me to have an open conversation about what was happening between us. We both acknowledge that we enjoy each other's company and have feelings for each other, but want to take things slow. Meanwhile, my dad was sending me long messages, calling me foolish for not doing what he says and claiming he no longer cared. He told me David only wanted me for one thing and didn't care about me as much as he did. He also said that if David truly loved me, he'd ask for my dad's permission to date me and follow his rules. David reassured me that he does care about me and that my dad's claims were false. We decided to continue hanging out, especially since my dad claimed not to care anymore. We both have annual passes to Disneyland, so we planned to go there together after work. While we were there, my parents texted me, asking if I was at Disneyland. I ignored their messages. We stayed until the park closed, and as we were walking out, my dad suddenly appeared with a Starbucks bag, asking to talk. David kept walking, saying no, and I, trying to keep the peace, begged David to talk. He refused. I reminded him that I was his ride, but he said he'd just get an Uber. So, I left my parents standing there and drove away with David. I cried in the car, but David told me it wasn't my fault. While driving, I texted my mom, asking how she knew I was at Disneyland. She replied, God is watching. I asked again, and she said they'd tell me in person. I told her that was weird and insisted she just explain. She stopped responding, but then my dad sent me this message. My name, if you want to know how we knew you were there, you can talk to us in person. We came in peace and tried to be loving, even though I knew David wasn't keeping his word. I just want him to care for you as much as your mother and I do. You're going to see the truth eventually, and it's sad. He had every opportunity to confess his love for you and ask for space, but instead, he ran away like a coward. From now on, you are not to come to my house. We can meet in public if you want to know how we found out you were at Disneyland. I've never lied to you and never will. I have nothing to hide. We could have had a great conversation, but David isn't willing to. I've never treated him with anything but kindness, like I would a good son. I hope he doesn't do what I fear he will. Wolves separate the sheep from the flock, but the good shepherd will protect you. If David truly was a good person, he'd listen to those who love him. I love you, and I wish nothing but the best for you. If you want to talk, we are here. I responded. 
Dad, I don't expect him to be in love with me. It's way too soon for that. If you don't want to hide anything, just explain how you knew I was there. I'm not meeting in person for something we can discuss over text. He replied, Then don't meet with me. You need to see my demeanor, and it's shameful you're trying to point the blame at us. You and David are the ones hiding. All the qualities you liked in David are now gone because of him. My name, do whatever you want. I'm done with this pain. Don't come to my house anymore because we won't support your drama. You'll have to learn the hard way, and now, your mother and I feel nothing. God will reveal the truth, but I wanted to protect you from being hurt. I don't care if I don't meet with them. I can't handle their helicopter parenting anymore. It feels like my dad always forces himself into my relationships, pushing the guys away. The ones who were okay with it eventually left because of my fear that my dad would continue to control my life. I really like David, and he hasn't run away despite my parents' involvement. I'm 24 years old, and for once, I want to make my own decisions without them controlling everything. I don't know what to do next, but I'm mostly concerned about how my parents tracked me down at Disneyland. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for reading this far, please. Any suggestions would help because I feel so alone. Edit, thank you to everyone who gave advice. I've decided to take a few days to settle my emotions before agreeing to hear my parents out. I'm going to meet with them to find out how they tracked me, as I still love them despite their controlling behavior. My dad said he would explain in person, so I'll give myself time to prepare before that meeting. I'll post an update when that happens. Your advice and support have really given me peace of mind, and I can't thank you all enough for reassuring me that this isn't normal. Edit 2. I texted my dad, agreeing to meet with them in a few days. He responded by telling me I need to find a new phone provider. This is the last bill I share with my parents. I suspect they've been tracking me via my phone provider, especially since my dad is now trying to cut me off. I checked for tracking devices like AirTags, but didn't find anything. He still refuses to explain how they tracked me unless I meet with him, my mom, and our pastor at church. Update. I met with them today. My pastor and his wife had my back completely. My dad finally revealed that I had been unknowingly sharing my location with him through my phone's messaging app. After discovering that, my parents drove to my house, saw David's car there we carpooled, and waited outside Disneyland for us to leave. I told them that this behavior was uncomfortable and felt invasive. They claimed they did it out of love because they were worried. My pastor and his wife fully supported me in deciding who I date and not letting my parents control my relationships. They said I should have the right to get to know someone before introducing them to my parents. My dad didn't like this at all. He said he would leave the church and blocked me on social media. He claimed he couldn't stand by and watch my heart get broken. The conversation ended with my dad saying he wanted no contact, but I'm doubtful he'll follow through. It's tough because I love my parents, but it seems like my dad needs control in every aspect of my life. For now, it looks like this is how things will be for a while. Thanks again, everyone. Story 6 Yesterday, I was in the changing room with my classmates after P when they started ganging up on me about speaking English. We live in Slovenia and I am Slovene, but I only returned to my home country after living abroad for four years in 2023. While abroad, I attended a European school where I spoke English almost all the time. All my classes were in English, with a few in French. Because of this, I speak fluent English, think in English, and even dream in English. Sometimes, I have to translate a sentence in my head or use Google Translate because my thoughts naturally come to me in English first. At school, I do speak Slovenian. However, their issue seems to be that when I speak to myself or make general comments, I sometimes say things in English without even realizing it. My brain is just wired that way now, and I don't always notice which language I've spoken until a few seconds later. Their argument was that I've been back in Slovenia for a year now and should have switched back to Slovenian fully by now. It's not that I don't want to switch, it's that it's hard for me right now. They even told me that the boys in our class laugh at me when I speak English. 
While that may be true, these are the same boys who have laughed at a chair before, so I'm not too concerned about their opinions. My classmates didn't give me a chance to explain myself, and one girl even yelled at me about it, which seemed unnecessary. I've heard she has some family issues, which people use to excuse her behavior, but that doesn't make it okay. Then, they made a mistake by asking me what my mother tongue is. They obviously expected me to say Slovenian so they could use it against me. While I do speak Slovenian, my mother tongue is also French. I lived abroad as a child and learned both Slovenian and French at the same time. In fact, I spoke mostly French until I started first grade. I still speak French with my mom to make sure I don't lose the language, even though both my parents are Slovenian. So, when they asked me, I took the opportunity to use this as a clever loophole. Now, I've decided to speak French to all of them. I don't directly talk to them much, but whenever I say something to myself or in their general direction, it's in French. It's actually quite fun and a good way to keep practicing the language since I usually only speak it with my mom. I think I'll keep this up until someone apologizes. For now, I only speak in non-French languages with two of my classmates, my best friend, who was on my side the whole time, and another girl who has, I guess, sort of apologized. Both of them don't mind me speaking in English.